All right, Chewy. Hey. Finally doing it. Chaz. How are you? Good. Man, I'm so <laughs> glad to finally have you on here. Oh, I'm glad to be here. It's an honor. <laughs> <laughs> Headphones and all. Well, give me a little background of how we started. Oh, man. Uh, it, it started when I was stealing workouts from you. <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> So it's Gold's Gym, I guess. Uh, what, ninety three or something? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I was in high school. That, that's how you started. You started as a twenty mid twenties guy. Yeah. Right. Sure. Not too far out of college. And did did you play a sport in high school? Yeah, I played soccer. You did? Yeah, and a little soccer. But I guess all of my friends started with you. So it was, uh, I guess, Bobby Polk friends late scott polk Mm -hmm. god rest his soul yeah his dad uh i guess he was the one that kind of discovered you essentially with gold's gem right yeah i mean that's that's how that's how it's right i mean yeah and so you're young and hungry in a honda civic at gold's gym (laughs) (laughs) and somehow you were like you know this larger in life character Making all my friends vomit <laughs> in a, at Gold's but, Gym. <laughs> you trained at a Gold's Gym, but just stole the workouts. Yeah, from well, I, yeah, from Fred and I'm with some other friends, <laughs> and then I'm, of course, our my, uh, Chad was yeah our inner class yeah um, at Web, and then um, so we've gone back what long forever? I mean, 25 years yeah. or something like that. So and and you did so literally. I w- I would I mean so all my friends they would have like you know they pay the Forty dollars an hour, what it was back then, and there was no way I could get my parents to you know pay for that. So I would let them work out, and I would like stand around the corner. Yeah, and I had another friend of mine that was kind of the same way. His parents wouldn't pay for it either. I think and it was twenty five, twenty five dollars an hour. Yeah, and I would be like, all right, I think they did uh, four sets of twelve. And so that you guys move on to another e- exercise machine, and then we go in there <laughs> and start doing the worst same workout. We're at what, what we thought was the same workout. We're like, okay, we'll, we'll do enough so that we don't vomit like the others. <laughs> it's different training days, I think, for you guys. And you, those were the days when you were doing working out with like Colquitt. DeLong was And uh, what's his name? Um, Carl Pickens. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Back in the day stuff. So that, that's, that, that's kind of how it started with me. Yeah, so that started, you know, I want to make sure we come full circle all the way to what you're doing and what you've been doing. Mm. And, you know, I think you have the most pictures on the wall at the Wood Gym. I think it's seven. Oh, I don't know yeah. that many. Yeah, I think you have seven pictures on the wall. So <laughs> That's crazy. So there's something about you that oh, man. has, you know, made you the... Um, I, I just put pictures up there. Well, I mean, <laughs> so, listen, when, when, Harrison, you know, when Harrison Smith walks in and goes, is Chewy in here? I'll we'll oh, get a picture man. with him. You know, oh, that's, no, that's, that says nice. a lot, you know, so that's, oh, that's, that's huge. So let's take it all the way through of like, I think we just get right to your hobby, you know, like your profession. We know you're a doctor, but yeah. like, how did you get into man, I, climbing what you're doing? And, and I never knew that you had a passion like that. Like that just came it, out of nowhere. It, it, I mean, because honestly, it did kind of come out of nowhere. I think when I think if we kind of backtrack when I first came back into town, because I, I mean, uh, it was kind of an on and off again relationship. Like well, I, I took all the guys on spring break, and <laughs> yeah, you took. I mean, if we got to go that, that you oh know, man, that's, you know, forget about that's a, that. That's a, that's another that's another podcast. That's but it was I was awesome. your chaperone. You, you were a chaperone uh, at uh, – in. I was 25. You had to be 25 or older. Older. To signed to, for the condo at Panama City. Panama City. And you took a whole bunch of 17, 18-year-old dudes to yeah, Panama City. Yeah, and we City. had two different places. Because yeah. Because remember, Pennington stayed somewhere else. Yeah. And I was going back and forth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> checking on everybody. Yeah, Do you remember everybody. that? Oh, yeah. God, that was a mess. Uh, uh, and it was ridiculous because it was like uh, – we had no business being there with you. No, no. <laughs> it was my spring break. <laughs> yeah, but it was uh, hilarious. I mean, it was like Chad Chad was there. and Freddie. As Chad before Chad was Chad. Oh, yeah. I mean, Chad was like, you know, his his feet weighed more than his yeah. body. Yeah. And uh, 172 pounds. Yeah. I recall. Yeah. And, uh, so then you went 
you went away to school. Yeah, I went away to school. And then every once in a while, I come back in town like summers and, you know, I kind of saw the evolution of your training. I mean, you know, Olympics, you throw that in. I would just get a snapshot of it mm-hmm. when I come back, all that. And then I, I left for like 13 years because I was school and all that kind of stuff. Came back and then. How man, old were you when you came back? I was in like 32, something like that. 32, 33. So a lot of time passed. I, I mean, I left when I was 18. And then I came back like you know, 31, 32, right. something like that. Right. I mean, time just flew by. But then, so the wood gym had, I mean, there was no wood gym. There was no wood gym when I left. Uh, and there was, I mean, there was a place in Hamburg. There was a place in behind Grace and Pontiac. Yeah. I think that's where you got the name Grayson, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, that's but, awesome. Yeah. But, no, but there was, I mean, that all of that time you were you were changing and developing all. And so when it came to the wood gym, I think the wood gym had only been open for about for a year or two or something like that. I don't know. You trained. When I did you not, came back. You were in here. I was in here. Okay. Yeah. And 2003, so, I think, is when I, I started that. 2003. Oh, is when okay. I, wait. Then I came back in like 2009. So you had been the wood gym had been open for a long time. So anyway, uh, but all the training had changed. It was awesome. I mean, it was so different over here. The you know turf work, the plyos, uh, you know obviously the Olympic stuff, and just everything that was going on. And it came at a great time because I had just come back and, and always loved working out. But you know, it's working on your own. And then having someone kind of tell you, this is what the hell you need. Well, working out to training. Yeah, it's different. completely different. And so I started doing that. And then you were like, hey, you should try mountain biking. So it's, it's always so weird. It's kind of like, okay, what is this? How, how do you translate mountain biking into all the stuff that you do? Okay, because if there's, it's not just some random accident when you, you suggest something, right? There's always like a, a a clear reason if I pin you down for it, you'll give it to me, you know, if you ask. And so I'd been training for a while and I was like, man, you know, it's kind of boring just to train here and do nothing. So our good friend, Fred had been doing it for a long time and, you know, inspiring guy. He'll be on this podcast. He'll talk about all of his accomplishments with training. Our friend Chad, obviously I didn't have to be convinced, you know, that, what you were doing was working in a lot of ways because it, you know, I saw Chad's career unfold before our eyes. Um, and in no small part, large part because of you, your belief in him methods, the whole deal. So I was just like, okay, whatever you tell me to do, Charlie, I'll, I'll do. I mean, it's, I, I tell, it's a great way to shut my mind off and just trust in a, in someone that you trust. Right. But so, weren't you in New Mexico doing, you yeah, know. I was. I mean, I was New Mexico. Just but you were ahead of the game with it, like the MMA. Well, I not really. I mean, I I knew uh, there, there were some guys. Greg Jackson, as you might, I didn't even realize he was such a big deal. But mm-hmm. you know, I pop, popped into his gym before, and it was like, so this whole you know, whether I knew it or not, I mean that that guy had a very similar spirit to what you do here. Everything was so Spartan. Um, in there and it was just no frills, no thrills. He was a very humble guy. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm no MMA dude, but I, I, I saw a little bit of that. And we, but you're we, doing the grappling, the jiu Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, a little, so little that bit was of, your... Somewhat of an outlet. But even then, I was so busy that it was just dabbling. That was your training. It was dabbling, dabbling okay. and all that stuff. So um, then the mountain biking... On top of the training and this and that, I mean, I was, so I real I've always loved being outdoors, right? And mountain biking here in our area is a lot of fun. It's great. You encouraged me along to do that, so I did a lot of that. And I was like, you know what? But I, I want to do something with this, you know, these the training, all this physical stuff that we've been doing, and you've been pushing me to do and all that. So. I up and decide. I love traveling, so I up and decided to go to Africa to go climb Kilimanjaro. Yeah, okay. Let me stop you there. So what you're saying, I want to do something with the training I got. You're doing. I don't know if you're doing the Olympic then, but the mountain bike and the strength training, the jumping. You're doing a lot of plyos. You're yeah. Jumping. I still don't know this after all these years of being with you. Mm-hmm. How did you go? 
I think I want to climb some mountains instead of like using the disciplines that you have for training, your mountain bike yeah. and going, why, why didn't you pick it like Freddie and go, I'm going to get into some mountain bike. Yeah. Yeah. Next I, I, How did you move? There had to be some interest. There had to be yeah. something you read about or some, something. You know, I, that's a good question. Um, there was, you know, yeah, we talk about like people's talent levels for certain things. Like the, the, the Fred Smith has a talent level for what he does that is, I mean, God given, unbelievable, right? I mean, there's just no, I mean, I, I, there's no way any one of us here in this wood jam can hang with his gifts, mm-hmm. right? And he's just kind of added on to all of it. Um, so I, and I tried mountain biking race. I'm like, I'm not, I'm, I can finish this thing. I'm not gonna be good at it. <laughs> so you did. I, th- I I did it once. I okay. think with Fred. I didn't know that. Yeah, and um. But I, I, I think it was more just because I love travel. I love traveling, especially back then when I was single. And at, at one point in time, I remember watching some IMAX movie of this kid climbing Kilimanjaro. He was like twelve years old, and that was part of the story, right? And I was like, man, look, I've been training here for a long time now. This twelve year old can do it. I, I, you know, I think I could do it. But I, I, I don't know. I just thought I, it was really kind of last minute. Within a month of the idea, I had booked and packed for the trip. I mean, it was kind of like a – it wasn't just like this, oh, man, I've had this long desire. It was just kind of one of these seeds Spur that was the made, made me kind You're of planted. last minute? Kind of. It kind of was. Climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Yeah, it was kind of was. I mean, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing, really. Honestly, there's a packing list. I picked this guide from a book. Um, the service and uh, that I got from Lonely Planet. I was like, well, I might as well do this. I got the time. I'm, you know, I'm single. I did, yeah. Might as well do it. And uh, I want to go to Africa and just, just what do it. What year was this? Uh, I think it was 2010, maybe 2000, something like that. 2010, maybe. But um, I was like, screw it. Let's just go. So I got a pack, you know, they, they had the suggested packing list. You should get by these things. I was like, okay, well, I'll go to the, Nobody's go to the mountain helping store. You, you didn't like no, hire I mean, anybody from Knoxville to no. help mm, you. you just... And I was just like, I've got this whim to do this. And I felt, I felt confident that I could do it because, you know, I've been training so much and, you know, working with you and all that, that I, I just knew that I could physically do it. But I, I, I did a little bit of reading just to make sure because high altitude is 19,000 feet. You got to do it right. I, so I took, you know, I made sure that I planned out a slower route and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I gave me my best shot at getting up to the top. And no climbing history before this. No. I mean, I went to like, you know, the trails over Cades Cove, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Knoxville. <laughs> That's yeah, before, it? I know. I think the last time I did that was probably like, I don't know, 15 years before that. Yeah. Know. So the, uh, the, well, what's the one in... The mountains that everybody does that you eat on Lacan yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't how, think I how, even did that. How high is that? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's like 3,000 feet or something. I'm not, I'm not even sure. I mean, maybe it's more than that. 6,000 something. I have no idea. But I, <laughs> So I, you, you didn't go – I didn't have You any. didn't build into it no. like everybody does with their hobbies of like, I think I want to go here and then I want to take it here. And no, I I, there. but no. I, I felt like building into it was just training here. You know, and so I – and I had spent some time on a mountain bike and, you know, a lot of time on the mountain bike back then. So I felt like, you know, I had a good shot at it because, I mean, it's like, why not? I mean, and so I went and I, I, re- I had no idea what the hell I was doing, really, honestly. I mean, the, the, the guides, the African guides that we had, they were probably better than most, but – at one point in time during my first route, it snowed and was wasn't supposed to snow. And you got to understand, like Africa is, you know, obviously very very poor, and some of these services that you have over there can be terrible. I mean, terrible, and they treat the porters awfully. And um, I made sure that you know that I got a service that actually treated the porters well. And the porters are the people that help like move your stuff to different camps. And I'm telling you, like, you wouldn't believe some of these guys, like, they're, they're wearing, like, used uh, dress shoes, and they're wrapping socks around them, um, and walking through snow, because that is, they're not getting paid anything to do this, and or very little, and um, 
so that's some of the services. They just cobble these people together and just throw them up there and with n- just not even the right stuff. And so, you know, when you're up there, you, you have to have glasses, sunglasses to protect your eyes from the snow because you, you, you just like you're getting sunburn on your skin, you can sunburn your eyes and that'll ruin your entire trip. And you have to have certain protection of your eyes, um, you know, all time, especially when you're on the snow. Well, these guys didn't have it. A lot of them didn't. So when we went up to our first route, okay, your guides didn't have sunglasses. Well, my guides did, but some of the porters, the people that were, you know, also there. I mean, just a whole train of these porters, these African guys that were carrying your stuff. I mean, you know, you shouldn't be impressed with the climbers. You should be impressed with these porters and what they are carrying in order to get up and down certain areas and they're making your life nice and they just are not i mean they they're working harder than you are and and uh, with less you know equipment and all that and to to the point of danger and and that's not good for for some of these services so anyway these our first route up up there it started snowing wasn't really supposed to snow you know it's just the time of the year these guys aren't wearing the proper sunglasses and they're these guys are coming out b- almost blind from the effects of the snow or and the ultraviolet light reflecting off the snow into their eyes, just basically kind of sunburning their eyes, going, going snow blind. And so, I mean, these guys were walking out of tents, they couldn't see, you know, we have good sunglasses on, so we're not having any of these problems. And so, they're like calling off our route because the snow wasn't supposed to be there and these porters were falling off, you know, not falling off the mountain, but just, you know, had to go back down. And what are porters? Porters are the just African um, over there, just men that help carry your equipment, your tents, your food, you know, to the next camp. They help set it up, the whole, the whole deal. And there might be 15, 20 of these guys in your camp. And, you know, while you're climbing, they're carrying your stuff. This is the style of climbing Kilimanjaro. Okay. So it's not always like this, depending on what climb you do. But in Kilimanjaro, this is a, it's a climb that supports porter services and all that kind of stuff. It's just the, it's a very English style of climbing. Okay. Where they've got people carrying all your stuff and they set up a tent for you. And it's just, you, you're really well taken care of, you know, over there if you get the right service. But these guys are falling out. And so my first climb, I'm up there and I'm like, oh, my God. So you're basically telling me that I, I've i come all the way to Tanzania and I have to turn around and go back home? And they're like, well, you know, if you want to, um, you know, we could do this other portion of the, the mountain where they're not essentially climbing. You're just kind of hiking around. And we, I had two or three older folks that were with us. Um, and they were like, yeah, well, you know, my back's kind of hurting and, you know, I'm not feeling pretty good. So they, they kind of like said, all right, we'll do that. So I'm like, hell no. I didn't come all the way to Tanzania to go fart around on some trails over here. I'm going over to this top of this mountain. So take me another way, dude. And so, yeah, that's what happened is I go like to this other route with this other guide and the guide over there didn't speak much English at all. I'm telling you like very little, like a kindergartner's level of English, but he's strong and he knew what he was doing. I could tell that I, you know, from what I knew, which was very little at the time. I'm like, dude, we were going up. Uh, I, you know, I don't care. And so what was nice is that during this entire climb, I felt really strong. And I think that was a lot, a lot to do with the training, everything to do with the training. Not, not a lot. Everything that we were doing in the wood gym was translating beautifully into into the climb, all right? And to the point where, you know, there's this whole Swahili term called pole pole, which is this overused term in, in Africa, or not Africa, but in Kilimanjaro, which means like slowly, slowly. Because they're like, oh, you got to just work really slow up the mountain. Um, you know, Are and they it's saying probably, that to you? They're saying that to everyone. You know, it's like... You know, jumbo means like, you know, hello, and then pole pole, and it's just that, this kind of like, you know, the Disneyland terms for Kil- Kilimanjaro, and it's just like, screw that, man, I'm not doing pole pole, I'm going up as fast as I can, because pole pole is boring, <laughs> and I'm not doing yeah. this, Yeah. and so, uh, you know, I, it, it, towards the, 
long story short, you, you got to climb in appropriate way so that you get used to the altitude. You go up, climb high, come down low sometimes, all this stuff. There's, as I learned later on, that w- there was so much more technique and all that. I didn't know any of this at the time. And so on the t- ascent for the summit, I'm like, I'm not doing this poly poly stuff, man. I, I'm just, you and me, we're going up. And I had another guy with us. It was just the, the three of us. So we had a support guy and then my lead guide and me. And we, as you could see the route to the top, you know, and you climb at night. Um, so it was a full moon, which was really cool. And then you could see in the distance, like a line of these people that were, had their headlamps on. So you could get, it's really neat, you know, the moonlight, and then you can see this the tr- ant trail of like lights, you know, going up to the top. I'm like, dude, we're going to be the first ones up to the top. And we were like hour and a half, like, um, behind because we got up later than most. So you're climbing through the night also? We're climbing up at the night. We get up, I can't remember what time we get up. So, uh, probably... Most people started at like, I think at like eight or nine o'clock at night. We started like 1130 and I'm like, we're going to be up, we're going to be first. So I, I mean, we had to like pass all these people along the route. I was like, by God, we're going to do that. And to, after a while, it was like us and no one else <laughs> and, and, and moonlight. And it was like, and then there was like one other guy that was up there. You know, I could see them, you know, it's like, we're going to get them. And, uh, and little did I know, this is probably all the wrong ways of climbing high altitude mountain, but I was like, we're going to go get him. So we, we climb and we, we catch this dude and pass him. <laughs> and he was, a, he was an interesting guy because we, we, I remember him talking to me, he was some like, you know, fuel engineer for, uh, you know, out that did a lot of work in the Middle East and he was a really, really cool guy. Um, but we passed him and then it was just us up there and finally get towards, you know, the summit. And then, um, this girl, I mean, I mean, women can be strong, man. (laughs) She passes me. And then there's another guy that passed me. So we weren't the first ones up there, but we were, by God, we were, there weren't many. And we spent a lot of time at the summit. Um, just us, it was still dark. We were supposed to climb with daybreak. So if you see the picture over here, like of me and Kilimanjaro, it's nighttime. It's not supposed to be nighttime. It's supposed to be daytime because we climbed up so fast. And uh, and and we're just kind of by myself. I think it might be on the other side. But anyway, so at that point in time, you know, lights come. You know, light day breaks up. You know, people are puking. I mean, people are not. Some people aren't doing very well up at the high altitude. And I felt great. You know, for the most part. So I was like, man, you know, I mean, maybe I have an aptitude for altitude. You know, because there, there, there are some folks that I mean, you get to fourteen thousand, fifteen thousand feet. They, they got, they get, they're getting really sick. I mean, we see all people being carted down. You know, with severe problems that you know, if they were up there any longer, that it, it, it could be life threatening. And for what, so for whatever reason, I felt like you know, I'm doing pretty well at altitude. Um, long story short, we came back down. I felt really strong coming down and of course at lower you go more oxygen you, you can have and you feel better and better i was like you know what i better learn how to do this the right way so i had a great climb it's beautiful it's fun but then i was like all right if i'm gonna do this i better get some real training on how to climb and so i started going over to rainier mountain which is kind of america's you know glaciated mountain where a lot of some of the better glacier climbers in America cut their teeth and started, you know, really training. And that's in Washington? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah it's near Seattle. Yeah. So, and, and there's a whole long history that I learned about Rainier from um, some of the guides that I, uh, you know, taught me and, you know, um, really great, awesome people. The more and more that I climbed, the more I was like, man, these pe- these guys are, you know, some of the people I met were awesome. Just, you know, just really loved how beautiful it was. And I mean, you know, I liked being out in the cold and stuff. And it's just something that I, I kind of fell into. I didn't really plan it this way. It just, it was all very calculated, slow steps because I didn't want to just um, do it the wrong way because then, you know, there was objective hazards it could be very, very dangerous. 
and respecting that. That was really important, you know, and learning from other folks that have been there and done that in more ways than I could ever do. And just being like, okay, these guys, if, if I need to listen to these men and women up here that know what the hell they're doing. Um, and uh, just kind of taking it piece by piece. Each mountain that I did, I was like, you know, how do I feel? And it, what was fun about the projects too is that you and I would sit down and we'd be like, okay, this next mountain, okay, it's not going to be as supported, right? I'm going to be my own porter. I'm, I'm not, you know, for this mountain. So, hey, Charlie – what do we need to do? You know, I'm going to be out here for this long and that, that whole process that you and I were, you know, sat down for a long time, you know, trying to get prepared for all that stuff. That was always, you know, a part of it, but it was slow. It was deliberate. It wasn't just like, even though the first time I went to do Kilimanjaro, it was not slow and deliberate. It was just like, oh, the hell with it. I'm just doing it. After that, it became like, okay, you got to do it the right way. Right. right. So you went to Kilimanjaro to Mount Rainier. Right. Yes. Like that was the order. Yeah. And, and, and Rainier in particular, so that I could learn mountaineering skills. Cause the reason why I picked that particular mountain is that I ran into a bunch of Americans. I was there by myself there for the second half of the trip in Kilimanjaro, literally by myself. Like we would climb, uh, we'd go over to the next routes and then like, there'd be no other Americans there. I mean, I mean, no, no even climbers there because we go through it so fast and and that all, all it was just me and some Africans at that point in time because it was no longer pole pole. It was just like whatever we wanted to do, which was great. It was a lot of fun doing it that way. In my, in my, <laughs> because it, you know I got to see a different part of the climb that uh, other people did because it was just like just, let's just go, you know. And then um, so I got to see you know how the Africans you know how they set things up and all all, all this stuff. And then, um, and would you it, say that's when you were like? Bit by the bug. Like, I, I, yeah. I think I knew that, like, oh, man, I could do this. You know what I mean? So it wasn't like, I, I, you know, I saw a lot of people just struggle. You know, and it was real. I mean, they weren't, these aren't weak people. They're not, you know, mentally, you know, whatever. It's just that so, I, I think I had a physiology that actually, I like, I mean, I did great in the cold. Everybody was, you know, they're like, oh, it's so cold over here. But when I got moving, I was burning up, you know, and... Also, other signs of just, you know, doing well in altitude and other things like that where I felt great and I was having fun and every, people were like suffering. And I think I think that was just me, meant that I, for whatever reason, I had a, um, you know, a, a genetic, whatever it was, to do well in altitude. I didn't know it at the time, but I, th- I think that really kind of lent itself to me being like, well, I'm having a lot of fun up here. I feel get. I feel you know. I, not everyone feels great, but I don't, I don't feel as bad as these other people do. You know. Yeah, I think it's funny that that you say you're having a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, like, I was. I was having a blast. I was having like the time of my life. And it's it's really interesting talking to you like that with that behavior of I've had a lot of fun doing this because we never really get to rap like this. Sometimes you'll sit in the office and chalk talk with the people of what you did, but like when you're talked about you know it still sticks in my head and it probably always will the antarctica one where, oh like, man that was great you climb. dropped off and and you had to pull a sled dude that was and great. you had to wait yeah. to be picked up because of visibility yeah. of, of the flight coming yeah. in i mean it's so and much that fun. was fun yeah it's so much fun man i can't even tell you how awesome it was That's, it was great i mean like yeah i mean those those types of um so take me through so let's circle back so, around so you're matt your, your Mount Rainier one. Yeah, and then Rainier. after that, like, you were like, wait a minute, I'm on a quest to do all seven peaks. Yeah, well, even then, I was I was like, well, I did one, and that felt pretty good. And so I was like, well, I'll just do this next one, which was Aconcagua. And that was kind of like... And where um, was that? In South America. So this is the largest peak in South America. And I, so I, I, I kind of picked these mountains that were... Look, man, uh, there are some amazing people, people out there. I'm no Conrad Anchor. I'm not even close to the guides that I work, work with. Let's just be honest. I, it's the truth. It's a God given truth. And, but I was like, look, I, for, I'm 31 years old. I didn't, you know, wasn't a climbing rat. I got into this late. Let's be smart about this and do the things that I can, cons- I can probably do based off the training and being realistic of how I felt. So let's just pick the next one, which is going to be a little bit harder than Kilimanjaro. Um, I'm going to be carrying more of my own weight, not all of it, but more of it for, for, for definitely for sure. 
you're carrying a lot more of your own weight and um and it's a bigger mountain so you're talking about 20 almost 23,000 feet in elevation it's just a big mountain and it's the largest in south america and how long was that because sometimes you'll be like hey Chaz, i'm gonna be gone for a month this one was two or three weeks. I yeah. can't remember. I can't remember and exactly. Then, some of these trips, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was like two months. Yeah, and you're like, who are you going with? You're like uh, myself. Well, and, and I would have my other guides and stuff. So there was a group of people that right, you but you're still with. traveling. Yeah. loner, you know, one on one by yourself. It's not when like you, once you get there, but then you're there with people that you in the way I did it. It's I mean, there's lots of different ways of doing it, but I I, I picked a service. And then I would just meet some of these people there and I'm like, okay, well, you better, better get along, do your best because, you know, people are going to be stressed out and be away from their environment. So you just, you know, be cool <laughs> because it's going to be a lot more fun if everyone's cool. Uh, so uh, anyway, that, that was the next one, Rainier or not Rainier, um, Aconcagua, because it was like, all right, it was a, very different. This time it was mules taking a lot of your stuff instead of porters to a certain base camp on the, this was on the side that I climbed and then they drop everything off at that base camp. And then you would have to man haul your own stuff to the next camp. So it was a definitely more austere climb, but it's been done a lot. And so, um, and it was definitely, it was definitely harder than, um, Kilimanjaro for sure. There's no doubt about that. Um, and that's when I'm, but I'm with, at this point in time, I'm with real professionals, you know, that pr- professional service people that really knew what the hell they were doing. Not that they didn't know in Kilimanjaro, but like, I couldn't, that guy couldn't speak English. This guy, this guy was like, you know, a professional, you know, guide and, you know, the services and all that kind of stuff. So it was, you know, I could learn more and all that. And, uh, so that was that was definitely um, you know a big mountain, and I was like, well, this is the test, you know, if I poop out on this mountain and I really struggle with this thing, you know, it just tells me, hey, this, you you've capped out, you know, and it and you got to respect the mountain because you know you don't want to go up there and lose fingers and toes and have some freaking bad outcomes because if bad, let's get real, bad shit can happen on those mountains. And right? you see that. Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, people getting way over their heads, not paying attention to the science of altitude climbing, you know, not respecting the weather windows, um, not respecting where they are physically, not being honest with themselves up there, not getting prepared. I mean, just bad stuff can happen. Bad, bad stuff can happen. People lose their lives. They lose their fingers and toes. Is is it like athletes where you say that uh, like – Oh, I can tell this guy's not going to be able to make it. Oh, yeah. This girl's not going to, you know, like when everybody yeah. know, gets off the plane, it gets the base oh, yeah. camp well, or and, whatever and, it is. But then it's like, it's like, uh, yes, there's a lot of that. And then there's, then there's also, you know, those surprises. Too. The goofy guy or whatever. Yeah. It so it's like, you know, you're like, uh, you know, this team has no chance in hell in beating the, right. the, um, the undefeated juggernaut. And then they somehow do it. Right. right. So I, I've definitely seen that side of it too. I'm like, this guy is a, freaking mess and by god he's finished the damn mountain and it's like oh man he had something else that that really you know that and i love seeing that but then you see a lot of folks too that you're like you have no business being up here that's what i was gonna say is there like let's take baseball like you have single a double a triple a like your Mm -hmm. levels go and oh i'm in the major leagues yeah can people just pick that mountain and go, hey, I, I think I want to climb it. And then the fastballs are coming. They're like, I have <laughs> yeah. no business being on this mountain. Shoot, man. Yeah, I mean. Like you, there's no cuts I, or tryouts. I, there's no, yeah. I mean, depending on the, ser- like if you, some of these bigger mountains, you can probably pick a service that will just take your money. And this, they'll just like, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take you to the mountain. So I could go on a website and, and sign and up, sign up for Everest or something like that. I can. Yeah, well. So the better service, professional services out there would be like, what's your climbing resume? Gotcha. Okay. What's your resume? Who did you climb with? And sometimes the better services will be like, okay, because it's a small world, climbing service. You got to imagine there aren't a lot of international climbing worlds out there, right? I mean, like how many business? So they all know each other. 
and they're all pretty much located in certain small areas uh, like you know S- Seattle Washington okay and they all cut their teeth out there and they all know each other they know all the politics and the business and the, you know the, uh, uh, everyone's dirty laundry and underwear over there i mean they all know each other right they know what's up with the business especially these professional services right and so and if you with Charlie Patron with zero experience climbing mountains say, well, I'm going to do this Everest. And they say, okay, yeah, what, what did you climb? Well, nothing. No, no problems. Drop, you know, all this money. We'll take you up to the top. Well, you would be discredited as a professional service. However, you can find someone that will do that. And that's the problem with some of these bigger mountains is that you do have these very unprofessional services that will, they don't even have the right Sherpas or, you know, if, say you're trying to do a Himalayan mountain that have any experience, you know, getting you up to the top or any real experiences, they'll hire just whoever they want, take whoever you want, take your money, and they know, hey, you're gonna, you're not gonna do well on this mountain, and great because I can take your money, and you're triple end early. I don't have to go through the objective hazards, and they've they've pulled a fast one on you. Interesting. Yeah, so that that definitely happens over there, but. You know, that's why you need to pick reputable services and the reputable services will do their due diligence and be like, okay, you climbed when, with who, how in shape are you right now? So you they know, check you get, them out. Oh yeah. They'll check you out. What's your medical history? What's your, all of the stuff. So, and even then there's, a, that's a bit of a screening out process, but sometimes even, you know, that doesn't always, that doesn't guarantee that you're going to have a successful climb or that you're going to do well. I mean, it, it's probably as good as it gets in vetting services but it's not always a guarantee that you there's no guarantee that you'll ever get to the top well let me ask you this like when you climb to the top Mm -hmm. and i don't know you could probably tell me what's harder or not like coming down or is Mm -hmm. the rush done you know after you get to the top and you're like okay now it's it's gravy coming down yeah people still struggle yeah so uh my first couple climbs especially the one in africa i i was like had all this energy to get up to the top and I was like, oh, you know, I did it. I'm done. You know, hooray for me. All of my psychological energy was just like devoted to getting up to the top. I'm done. And then I started climbing down and I kind of started falling apart a little bit because first of all, you've been climbing for, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours and you're, you're in rarefied air. So you don't have a lot of oxygen up there. And I didn't know this at the time, but the, most problems that you have as far as potential accidents are usually on the descent and not the climb. That's what I was And the sure. hardest part is the descent. I didn't know that. I learned that the hard way. And, um, you know, so you got this guy that doesn't speak any English. He he's, can run up and down that mountain, no problem. He can't relay some of that information to me or maybe didn't even think to relay the information to me. And I'm just like, holy shit, this is hard. And, um, so, oh, and you have to kind of experience that. I mean, there's no way of really knowing that. I mean, you just got to <laughs> go through your, you know, hard knocks with that stuff. And so later on, I was more tempered with my enthusiasm with the, um, the, the, the top. Get, get the top. Yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, yeah. All right. We got a, this is only half the story here. So the climb. The climb is the climb, the climb. up and down. Oh, and yeah. It's the whole damn – considered a climb. I think you just have to look at it. it maybe, it's, maybe it's like life. I don't know. But it, you have to look at the totality of the entire damn trip. Right. You know, from okay. – start. Well, it's, trip's not over until you get home from Africa and you land in Tyson Airport. <laughs> you know, I mean there's like, there's so much that can happen in between. And so you just need to be, you know, for me, at least, I had to be emotionally kind of more spread out, more even. So you're like, okay, yeah, smiles. I'm glad we're up here at the top. But let's, you know, there's a shitload more climb left, especially coming down. So you've got to be switched on, especially some of these more dangerous mountains um, where you have to, you know, clip in, clip out. And you're carrying all your weight and all the stuff. You really have to be like, okay, this is – just as part of it's just part of the climb the, the 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 top to me at that point was just part of it you know and there's so much more left and until we're off even when we got back you know at, with some of these climbs we're waiting for the f- flight out 
you might be there for a long time, depending on the weather window. So you can't just like, you know, shoot your emotional wad at the top and just be like, okay, you got to be, you got to, you got to be like, all right, well, you just got to be, just be even be cool as that, that was a strategy I took. And I thought that that worked better for me. Well, I mean, as I got more experience. Well, that's the mental toughness that like, Mm -hmm. you're always in the top of the conversation, whatever athlete is in here and we're talking, I'm always bringing up Chewy of the mental toughness of reading a book in a tent waiting three or four <laughs> yeah. days or, you know, <laughs> even, even the slap crazy. talk we were talking about a couple of days ago where I was like, Oh, when do you shower? Oh, and you're yeah. like, what? And I'm That's like, it. well, where's the facilities to shower? And you're like, <laughs> yeah, you don't have them. You know, you're talking about like, yeah. you know, boiling water to, you know, and digging a hole and going outside and yeah. in degrees that was. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, that's part of the climbing too is just like, you know, how, learning how to live without services. Um, I mean, you have services, but like not in the same fashion that you have here at home where, where you've you know, shower and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you, you got Instagram you got, and, yeah. and, you know, believe it or not, no, there's, there's people, uh, these climbs are more and more well-worn. So they, people will put like cell phones, towers and stuff like that. So people can, it's not a bad thing sometimes because you want to, you know, family members are like, where the hell is, you know, this person. And so, you know, to give them, so a you day. can do that every now. once in a while, depending on the mountain there, there might be opportunities for that. Or people are using satellite phones to, you know, blog in and say, hey, we're at camp, you know, high camp. We're going to try and make our ascent tomorrow morning. And so they'll, you know, they'll, that's how sometimes we communicated with loved ones is that our, our guide would write in a blog saying, hey, we're here. Everyone's safe. You know, that that's, that's important for your family to know that type of stuff. So, um, but now, I mean, I, I don't know. I, it's been a little while since I've climbed some of these mountains. So th- I, I wouldn't be surprised if they had, I mean, internet service. I mean, damn, internet service is everywhere now. It's so, crazy. I mean, we, they were, they were, let <laughs> me put this in perspective. When I was uh, at some of these climbs, I saw a freaking Pete Sherpa with Google cameras. No shit, Google cameras that were, you know, that, that you would drive through, like, you know, your, neighborhoods you know how they take those 360 degree photos to say at any point in time on this route you can see you know what's around you on google map they were doing that on these mountains man that's how crazy the world is it's kind of amazing that google would be at damn mount everest um so anyway the world is smaller but it's it's kind of crazy but yeah but getting back to your point there's still no toilets (laughs) toilets <laughs> there no matter if google's up there or not you still have to you know crap in a bucket <laughs> <laughs> so you know i know like i said i'm repeating myself but six or seven pictures you know some climbs could you pull back the hardest climb that you weren't gonna make or struggling or oh, was yeah. it going smooth you know yeah. I, I think that aconcagua climb was a real over the Antarctica where you're like pulling a sled. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's always little moments uh, that were tough. Um, but I think the – I learned I – I was so inexperienced um, and just didn't know – just didn't know a lot. Um, it, you know, but I was leaning on these guides and other people to kind of help me out. But I think Aconcagua was one where I literally – I mean, I had a great climb. It was one of those situations where I was climbing and doing really well and I'm feeling great. I didn't know the nutrition end of it very well. And so I was eating all the wrong shit, man. So I was basically eating like Kit Kat bars and freaking, you know, snickerdoodles. Uh, Like on my scent, just doing stupid stuff. And like, um, and I was like, you know, and I'm lactose intolerant. So I'm eating all these like milk chocolate candies and then kind of bloated like crazy. It's terrible. <laughs> so anyway, I, I get up to the top of Aconcagua feeling pretty good. And then it was that same damn thing. I bonked. I mean, I bonked hard, hard on the way down. Bad. And uh, I was I just, I was not eating. Apparently snickerdoodles aren't the thing to eat on climbs when you're at 23,000 feet. So I bonked, man. I was just hit a freaking wall. And you get to get the hell off that mountain. You're 20, there's no so what do you no do? good reason to be up at 23,000 feet. You need to get the hell off. 
fortunately we had good weather um and my guides had a you know they're like or eat this take this off you know like all this stuff and like you know but i'm like God, i felt like a piece of shit because i was like dude i do not like being this drag ass person man i'm mean, like this is bullshit and i'm like i'm not eating snickers anymore man <laughs> so, like, fuck this oh uh anyway so yeah, that was a big learning point. And I had good guys that were really helping me out. I was like, okay, well, I, and that, and that was also the whole like other lesson of saying, damn, this is not the top. is not the top, man. It's the top and coming back down safely in one piece. That was such a important lesson. I mean, maybe that's an important lesson in life too. I like that. Uh, but the top. yeah, no, it's yeah. like, dude, there's a finish line to all this thing and you can die at coming down. No shit, you can, and it's like you better, well, that's what I was thinking. You better, like, you better get that all together. No, not just think about the damn top. top. You better, what you, what's your exit strategy? Because that's more important. More important because you got to be alive and you got to have your fingers and toes. You got to get that all together. That was a hard lesson to learn. I was like, Ugh. so out of all of them, you know, because that, that was probably the biggest, most important lesson I learned uh, up there. Yeah, other times where I was like, my feet, like, oh, God. Another important lesson is to have good shoes. <laughs> so my, and my feet are, like, really small, like, delicate baby feet. And they, <laughs> they're, like, soft. <laughs> and they get chewed up, man. I mean, like, bad. And so, I mean, it's like, uh, get, get insoles. That's another good lesson. <laughs> so, you know, people don't even know that the year the uh, Mount Everest – yeah. The avalanche that yeah, you bad. were there. So, I mean, yeah. was that a hard one, tough one, or a disappointing yeah. one? Or? Yeah, I don't know. It was disappointing. It was really just mostly sad because, you know, you, you, all the loss of lives um, up there was really, you know, horrible. Um, because it, it's a, um, so that climb, you know, was my chance at Everest. So it was 2014. You and I had put together. You know, An amazing, great workout. It was amazing. I mean, we we were really. I was like running around in the trails at night in the cold, and uh, there's a trail run. Remember that? I guess do you remember that one yeah. story? You were like all set to go <laughs> to run in the trails at night, yeah. and it was so cold. You had your music ready to go on your yeah. phone, Damn and it died. died. I was like, now it's cold, dark, and silent. It's like, <laughs> it's like shit. God. But uh, yeah, I all that, that stuff. You're like, well, fuck it, let's go. Yeah, you still have to run, I guess. You but still yeah, have to run. <laughs> but it was uh, yeah, we had a lot of good. I mean, that's another th- thing you talk about. That's fun training stuff that you, you put together. Well, and the backpacks what, with the water yeah, jugs, jugs in it that, to, yeah, to climb your yeah your building downtown. Yeah, I mean, that, all of those things. You know, feeling good uh, on a mountain. That was all you know, careful planning on your part to make that happen. So, I mean, I, I don't want you to say, Oh, this is all genetics. No, man, dude. I mean, you, you, you put the si- the work into making me work the right way. So well, that was great. I mean, <laughs> for a guy, that, you know, there are nine and a half out of 10 people, uh, the trail run in the dark and cold and the phone goes out with the music. Most of them would be like, yeah, let's bag this. We'll get back in the car. <laughs> like, I'll do it tomorrow. You yeah. know? And you're like, you just, oh, I still got to run. Yeah, you do. Cause I mean, you, the bottom line is that when you want to go over there, you don't want to freaking just barely make it through, man. You want to have a good time. And your good time is dependent on how fit you are. I mean, that's that was my thought. Well, I'm spending your all this da- damn time and effort. I might as well have fun with it. And it is fine. But if I'm out there just like miserable because I did not put the work into it, then what the fuck? Why am I doing this? You know, this is not it. It's got to be fun, right? I mean, yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we got fun's relative <laughs> yeah, yeah. to people for sure. But yeah. that's what makes you you, bro. Yeah. I mean, that's what's awesome. But – yeah, well, it was, you got to be a happy. But that was disappointing. You didn't, you know, the yeah. avalanche. Oh, she, yeah, and, yeah. You know, I was getting phone that. calls at 12 a.m. God, AM, man. Have you heard from Chewy? Yeah, and, yeah. So it was, that was, God, man, that was such a crazy day. See, it's funny. I don't I don't think about this stuff anymore, you know, but, but then when we're sitting here talking about it, and, you know, these memories come back. So when we were at, you know, we would just start a climb. It takes a long time just to just start the climb. You know, because uh, just to get that Everest base camp on the south side. But you're telling me, like, mind you, I've had people in here that have dabbled with that and do yeah. all that. You're the guy that didn't get 
dropped off in the helicopter at a certain base. You no. started from scratch yeah. and went through it. It's you wanted to probably, experience the whole thing. Yeah, correct? you you need to do. Uh, you know, there's no real shortcuts to acclimating, you know, because you have. I mean, there's just a certain amount of time that you need to acclimate appro- appropriately. You can't accelerate that, and so it's not a smart move in my mind to just try to rush to the top and you're going to, you're going to freaking have some major, major health issues and you're not going to climb very well. So going through it slow, especially when you're talking about a huge Himalayan mountain, you know, going through the right steps of gradually going up there was in my mind, the way to do it. Um, are the, any other shortcuts can be just a disaster. I don't, I don't never really saw good outcomes with that ever. So it's, just a matter of doing it as to give you the best chance of success as possible. And that might take some time, you know, and it may, it might be inconvenient, but that that's just the only way you need to do it because you want to do it in style. You don't want to just screw it up. Right. So, um, but anyway, so we went over there, it took a long time to get up to, you know, a base camp, which always does. And then we were going through some, you know, training, to, to get up to the next camp, just camp one. And so, but you have to go through this ice fall, Kumbu ice fall, which is, is you know, uh, probably the most dangerous part of the climb. Is, is that straight up at the, the beginning? Um, and these huge ice blocks that are part of this glacier. I'm talking about these ice blocks can be three story houses, the size of these ice blocks. They're constantly shifting and moving. You have to pick your way through there. I mean, in, in the ice fall doctors, the Sherpas that are there, and they're called ice fall doctors, they will pick a route to get you through all of that, which is the quote unquote the safest route. And it's and there's no right answer to this. It's just and it shifts and changes every year. So it's no no right way. And so our guides had gone through there and they were like, Yeah, there's this really sketchy area. They're like, they kept their eye on it. They're like, oh, I don't know, maybe we should talk to the icefall docks, but they've already kind of sent put set the route. We did some acclimation height uh, climbs up through the icefall halfway, not even halfway, but up higher. The whole concept is you go up high and rest low. Okay, and that helps you acclimate. And so we did, you know, a few of these acclimate acclimation hikes, acclimation climbs, get your gear shit, you know, shake down and all this kind of stuff. Next day, we're supposed to go right through that to get up to Camp One, and um, no, actually, we, we had a rest day, and the day after a rest day, we're supposed to go through that 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 area. And sure enough, they had a bunch of Sherpa that were carrying, uh, you know, stuff through that one portion, and if it didn't fall right on top of them, it did, and killed a ton of people. And um, I remember I was an early riser. Um, you know, so I get up early, I always get up early. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, my, um, it, there's one other guide and I, we just, we were out there, we drink our, drink our coffee and then we're like, why are the helicopters up this early? They're, they're not up this early. And, um, the communication tent was like, you know, going off the radio and then we're like, oh no, something's happened. Yeah, that shelf that they were all worried about just landed right on top of them, killed all these guys. And then we spent the that day, a bunch of our guides went up there to go help with any rescue efforts. They couldn't really rescue anyone. They were just basically pulling out bodies from there and helicopters going up there to pull long lining bodies off of the um, off of the ice fall. It was horrible, 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 horrible. Um, and it ended up being, at the time, the biggest disaster ever said seen everybody knows the um into thin air story and believe it or not that film crew was there to film you know base camp scenes for that movie and they were hanging out in their tent you know here and there because our guides knew them and all that um jake gyllenhaal was not there he was not <laughs> no, he was, he was, he was he's an actor there. that's and right we're like who's in this movie and they're like jake gillen i'm like where are he where's he and they're like oh he's in england or yeah. something i don't know but anyway. exactly. <laughs> warm yeah. continent somewhere else yeah but uh so yeah i mean so into thin air that was the worst accident and then this one um as far as number of lives lost was i think it was worse from what i remember so it was just it was horrible there was like a whole bunch of political unrest after that because the Chirpa wanted more money and, um, you know, there's, they brought, brought in helicoptered in like, you know, bureaucrats to, you know, talk to the Sherpa and 
they basically some of the younger ones were like you know screw this we don't want to do this anymore and if you guys try to climb any higher um then we'll come after you we'll come after the sherpa we'll come after this you know it's just so it was just all this uh, so at the end of it all the um the guide services were like it's just not safe for a number of reasons done so the whole thing was packed up south side of everest was done for that climb, for that season so we all went back home and that was 2014 that's 14 was yeah. that your last no, I end up climbing another mountain um, in Russia. It's you know kind of uh, it was tallest peak in Europe, but it was when it wasn't like being in the Himalayas. It, was, well, it wasn't uh, Mount Lacan. Yeah, right? well, it wasn't a Mount Lacan either. I heard the food's good up there though. <laughs> well, they say because you're so hungry, yeah. Yeah. dinty, more chunky yeah, little soups. It. This that's, is delicious. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's it. Yeah, so that basically, you know. But then I, you know. Married kid now, so things are different. But so you're, you know, I know you probably got to get going to yeah, wrap yeah. it up, but you don't want to. I, I mean, would, just cause the risk. Like I don't think people. Know I would the risk. love. I mean, you know, I, I you know kind of have to shut off those desires. I was about bit. to say, do you still have them? How are you substituting them? You yeah, know, you know, I, I, you know, I always continue to work out here. You know, I'm doing jujitsu again, and you know other things like that to keep me homebound. You know, I always have to be doing something, um, but you know. You know, my kid and my wife, who's awesome, and my one on the way, that fills me up. And so it's just like, you know, there's nothing better than that. So, and, and I couldn't imagine being two months away from all of that. My my baby changes like every two hours, you know, right, and I right. love being, you know, seeing all that stuff. Right. So I, I just don't, I, 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 there's no, you know, had there been another life, you know, there's no wife, no kid, no, oh shit, man, I'd be, I'd be, a I'd be there. Yeah. yeah no doubt. I mean, yeah. there's no doubt, but you know, but life is different and changes and in a good way though. I mean, so I'm happy doing what I'm doing. <laughs> and how old are you now? I'm 41. 41. Mm-hmm. And where's, I'll ask you one last question. Where's all your gear? It's uh, collecting dust yeah. in my place I mean, right now. So those would be stories that you tell your kids and tell your yeah. kids. Yeah. I know? mean, and, and there's and there are plenty of other mountains climbs beside this damn seven summit thing, which has become its own weird, like, you know, you know, frustrated middle-aged people like myself go out there and try to live out their, you know, climbing dreams. That's a, It's become this industry of that. It gets so weird because it's like a bunch of damn mountains out there. It's not, these seven aren't the end all be all, but they well, kind of make it that way. Like it's like the best mud run ever, you know, like, you know, you gotta do the some, some, you don't have to do any of this. Well, so there's know. so, so, you know, I could go out and, you know, there's plenty of other cool climbs that glaciated and all that. Well, I know we can't hit on it all, but like, uh, you went from mountain climber to wild boar hunter. <laughs> you know it's for not, some reason you yeah. know the juice is the juice with just to be you, outside the action, i guess the <laughs> where you were in canada hunting boar with yeah. bow and arrows yeah. and bringing back meat and carrying them off the mountain it yeah. seems like that's your um yeah i don't know how you're going to substitute that, that with it's, uh jujitsu yeah. or training in the wood gym it's not as i'll be honest uh these stinky boar aren't nearly as cool as mountains but <laughs> I guess it's something. <laughs> well, I know you got to run, man. Yeah. I appreciate it. This is awesome. Oh, I could do this all day long with you. It's, yeah, and, man, and I know a lot of, hopefully a lot of listeners and viewers will get a different side of Wang Chung, Dr. <laughs> Chu. Dr. James Chu, everybody. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate well, it. You, well, thank You're you. the man. I love you to oh, death. I love you. It's and, awesome. And uh, I really appreciate it. And, uh, there are going to be a lot of interesting folks going to be on this podcast. Oh, I can't wait. But thanks for your time. I know it's valuable. Love you, buddy. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>